Good evening and welcome to the Roman Library. Hello. How are you? Um, I'd like to welcome you all here for Ann Barrett, who will be giving a talk on Short Skirts, Oh My, the Evolution of the Women's Movement, um, which women got the right to vote on this day in 1920. So it's been a while, thankfully. Um, and um, and so today we're celebrating in a, a little small way of the women's women's uh, women's And I just wanted to also mention a couple other programs we'll be having in this coming September. On September 16th, we will be having author J. Dennis Robinson, who wrote Under the Isles of Shoals, um, which is about archaeology and discovery. Um, and that will be on Monday at 6.30. Um, and then on September 30th, we will be having Matt Riggy, and he will be talking about his book, in Pursuit of Giants. And he's an author, conservationist, and sports fisherman. And he'll be talking about um, the great, three of the great big fish in the ocean and <coughs> conserving them. Well, that's a giant. So, looking forward to those. And we also will be having a Kindle class in September, and that's on September 28th which is a Saturday. It's from 11 to 12.30. So I just want to look in. And if you want to sign up for that, just let us know at the desk for any of those. And so, here is Ann Barrett, who is also the Vice President of the Tosfield Historical Society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Enjoy. Diane. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I am <coughs> delighted to be back here again. I was here last year. and great audience, and uh, I understand I have a couple of the uh, winners from last year's trivia quiz for baseball here in the audience, <laughs> so I'm glad to see uh, you folks back and some other new faces as well. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about totes for women, but we're going to talk about so much more than that. One of the things I like to do is, you know, a lot of people know history, you know, we read it in the history books, but I'm interested in kind of the story. How does it all knit together? Uh, and so that's really kind of what I focus on with all my presentations and with my research. And so that's what you're going to be seeing uh, tonight. Uh, and it's going to cover all kinds of different um, things. We're not going to talk just about voting or any of that. We're going to talk a little bit about fashion and some <coughs> things as well. So the 1920s represented an exciting new time for women uh, with new freedoms and opportunities that were so greatly expanded from anything that women had seen before, could not have been imagined by their grandmothers or possibly even their mothers. In the 1920s, conservative opinion proclaimed loudly that women had changed, become something different from what they had ever been before. Women, they said, were at the center of a fiery vortex the fiery youth of the modern age. They bobbed their hair, shortened their skirts, stuck bootleg gin in their garters, <laughs> and they danced to the wee hours of the morn. In general, they thumbed their noses at the conventions of their mother's world and turned their backs on American, the old good American virtues. Now these are easy generalizations to make and they've been passed down to us through the decades. Uh, but like most generalizations, uh, they are you know, somewhat true, but there's more behind it. First of all, the phenomenon was not all that sudden. It's not like all of a sudden skirts went whoop, up and 1920 came and hey, here we are in this new age. Um, women did not start to make themselves over because of the rumble seat and the purported uses of the rumble seat. <laughs> they did not make themselves over because all of a sudden they had the vote. Certainly <coughs> things started to change more rapidly coming up into the 1920s. But actually, things had been changing for decades before that time. 
as women began to reevaluate <coughs> themselves and their place in society and basically look for a new light, a new place, and a new role for themselves. We're going to journey through that time uh, leading up to this revolution. A time going back all the way to a time when skirts were long, opportunities were short, and women had not yet realized the dreams that they were going to realize in time. In 1776, Abigail Adams is known to have written to her husband John, who was then attending the Continental Congress. And she wrote, I long to hear that you have declared an independence. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I am sure it will be necessary for you to write, I would desire that you remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power in the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. <laughs> Men, are you, are you listening to this? <laughs> John wrote back, as to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot but laugh. Not an auspicious beginning. Rights for women were exceedingly limited. Before the Married Woman's Property Act of 1848, a married woman could not control her own property and assets even if those uh, property and assets had belonged to her prior to her marriage. Before 1848, some states began to make amendments and uh, state by state give women more uh, rights uh, as early as the 17th and 18th centuries. But by and large, women's rights were very limited. Of course, there are always exceptions. As a single woman of property in Maryland, Margaret Brandt appeared, Brandt appeared frequently in the front of the court. There was an illustration there uh, in front of the court to um, file suits. She sometimes represented her brother's interests as well, pleading cases for him. She was a very controversial figure, uh, but, uh, and I'm sure that there were other women similar to her who have just passed from history and nobody remembers them. In 1756, Lydia Taft was the first woman legally allowed to vote in colonial America. And this happened because the death of her husband and then the death of her son as well left her family with no legal male heir. And so the town of Uxbridge, Massachusetts, at town meeting, voted to allow her to represent the family. In a much more publicized case, Deborah Sampson, pictured on the right here from Plimpton, Massachusetts, took a different approach completely to, uh, to fending or to, to facing the male world. She disguised herself as a young man and enlisted for the Revolutionary War as Robert Shirtliff. She served for several years. She was wounded twice, once uh, in the shoulder and also had a head wound. And both times during treatment, she managed to avoid detection. Mm -hmm. However, she, uh, at, towards the end, she contracted brain fever. And at that point, uh, the surgeon uh, in charge discovered uh, her secret. Mm -hmm. uh, but contrary, <coughs> instead of doing uh, anything in public, she was simply removed to a private residence and cared for there. And it's said, not substantiated, but it is said that she was given actually a soldier's benefits at the conclusion of the war. Education for women took place in their homes or on a limited basis in schools. I say limited because, for example, when Susan B. Anthony attended school, because of her gender, certain subjects were um, barred, she was barred from studying certain subjects. Um, a woman was educated with an eye to her role, what was expected to be her role in educating her children uh, when she became a mother. And that would be rudimentary sorts of education. Uh, at, after she gave him or her, the children, their basic education, depending upon the family circumstance, 
any higher form of learning would be pursued in a, um, an academy or university by sons. It would later be written, the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. Limited education had historically been a large part of this tyranny. However, in 1821, the Troy Female Seminary, the first endowed school for women, was founded in Troy, New York by Emma Willard. <clears throat> Emma was a successful teacher and administrator uh, by the time she came to this role. And she wrote a pamphlet which was entitled, A Plan for Improving Female Education. And in that pamphlet, she laid out what the benefits to society would be of educating the female population. She petitioned the, the state of New York for funds to establish a school, but she was denied. However, the city of Troy, New York, raised $4,000 and said that they would establish the school if Emma would come and run it, which she did. The education offered was comparable to the education offered to, uh, for boys, a college preparatory uh, education for boys of that time, and include economics and philosophy and chemistry and natural history and such. Now, of course they understood that many women would still continue on and become uh, wives and mothers and therefore classes as well were offered in uh, home economics and management and such. If Emma couldn't find a textbook that she liked, she wrote one <laughs> for the <laughs> curriculum. <laughs> and the um, Troy Female Seminary became a model for education of um, females. It also proved that women had the ability to learn and excel in all subjects. Contrary to what some believed, some even questioned up to that time and after that time, the effect of education on a woman's health. And I quote, a girl can study and learn, but she cannot do all this and retain uninjured health and a future <laughs> secure from neuralgia, uterine disease, hysteria, and other derangements of the nervous system. This was written by Dr. Edward Clark in his widely respected Sex and Education, published in 1873. So ladies, have any of you had neurological derangement from your education. <laughs> you all look pretty normal to me. We just got married. That could be deranged. <laughs> <laughs> That's an education in and of itself. <laughs> in 1833, Oberlin College became the first co-educational college in the United States. As we all know, education is power and knowledge is power. And women were making the first steps on a journey that would take them a long time that would last nearly a century. A century. About that same time, <clears throat> in publishing the book Course of Popular Lectures, Fanny Wright became one of the first women to write specifically about suffrage. She was from Scotland and she moved to the United States to establish a socialist colony in Tennessee on land that she purchased that was modeled after a similar colony that she had seen in Indiana. Some aspects of Wright's community were extremely controversial. Her decision to encourage sexual freedom. Wright saw marriage as a discriminatory institution and started advocating free love. This is the 1800s, not the 1960s. <laughs> Wright also developed her own dress code for women. And uh, this dress code consisted of a bodice, ankle length pantaloons, and then a short knee length dress over it. And this, a similar costume, was adopted later on by feminists in the later part of the century. In her book, she wrote, Fanny wrote, uh, however novel it may appear, I shall venture the assertion that until women assume the place in society which good sense and good feeling alike assign to them, human improvement must advance but feebly. 
It is in vain that we would circumscribe the power of one half of our race, and that half by far the most important and influential. <clears throat> in 1840, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott met at an international anti-slavery convention in London, where they were outraged when the men of the assembly came together and voted that women would not be allowed to address the assembly, even though they had been sent to the assembly as delegates. Not only that, they were not to even be seen at the assembly. They were put in a section and roped off, so they weren't, a, weren't, weren't part of the assembly and could only view its proceedings from far away. This experience galvanized these women into further action concerning women's rights. In 1848, the first Women's Rights Convention in the United States was held in Seneca Falls, New York, which was, it was organized by Stanton Mott, Stanton Mott and several other women as well. Many of the participants signed a declaration of sentiments and resolutions that outlined the main issues and goals for the emerging <coughs> women's movement. And this marked the beginning of regularly held women's rights meetings. <clears throat> it's difficult for us to imagine, it's definitely difficult for me to imagine, but women organizing themselves and acting independently from men in this new way was a completely new concept. To compare, for example, this book was published in 1848, the same year of the Women's Convention, and I happen to own this, a copy of this book. It focuses on the proper behavior of women because up until that time, with the exception of some of the breakaway women that we've already talked about, a woman's appearance, her behavior, and her reputation were really all she could rely upon. For example, according to this little book, a lady's behavior in the street should be modest, dignified, yet pleasant and engaging. Never stare, never giggle, Never walk with a wriggle or swing side to side. Ladies are not al allowed upon ordinary occasions to take the arm of anyone but a relative or an accepted suitor. A question from a stranger beyond asking the most very necessary sort of question must be considered a gross insult and repelled with proper spirit. No pickup lines, thank you. <laughs> The Civil War disrupted many suffragist activities as women turned their energies to war work, serving as <coughs> nurses, fundraisers, spies in a few cases, and a few, as we've seen before uh, with the Revolutionary War, the same thing with the Civil War, a few actually in combat, in, in disguise. They also took on many more responsibilities and a much heavier role in running the households and often the, the um, farms and other uh, properties that they had while their husbands were away for months or years. During this time, they learned a lot of organizational and occupational skills. A great example of this, Clara Barton used her experience during the Civil War to go on and establish the American Red Cross. Many more women would later use their knowledge that they had gained uh, as they turned it towards suffragist activities after the war. In 1870, the 15th Amendment gave the right to vote to the black male population. Disagreement over this amendment caused a split in the American Equal Rights <coughs> Association, which had been formed back in 1866 uh, with a view to for universal suffrages, suffrage for both um, black men as well as black and white women. So there was a split, and Stanton and Anthony formed the National Women's Suffrage Association. Anthony had been a lifelong advocate for both anti-slavery and um, women's rights, but at this point in time, she began to turn more of her attention uh, towards women's rights. 
it said that these two very powerful, strong, and influential women did not always agree, uh, but that they made a terrific team uh, and managed to work as a team uh, because uh, Stanton was uh, a very good speaker and Anthony was a very good writer. Lucy Stone from Massachusetts, along with some others, organized the Boston-based American Women's Suffrage Association. Stone had attended Oberlin College, and she was the first woman in Massachusetts, reportedly, to earn a college degree. She was asked to write the commencement speech, actually, at Oberlin. However, she refused, because even though Oberlin was a co-educational institution, women were still barred from making public address. And Stone was not about to write a commencement speech, which would then be <coughs> delivered by one of her male colleagues. <laughs> In 1850, Stone was a leader in organizing the first National Women's Rights Convention, which was in Worcester, Mass. And if you remember, there was a convention in Seneca Falls, New York, in 1848, but that was more of a local. This was a wider-reaching um, convention. Lucy Stone's speech in 1850 is, is credited with helping to um, galvanize Susan B. Anthony into uh, more work towards uh, women's suffrage. Uh, Lucy Stone is also remembered for another first, being the first woman in the uh, United States to keep her own name after marriage. Mm -hmm. And while we're talking about Massachusetts women, a couple of others that are sort of local and, and worthy of note, Victoria Claflin Woodhull, who is pictured on the left. She was descended from the Claflin family, we were talking about the Wenham Museum, um, or in the Wenham Tea House earlier. Uh, the Claflin Richards House also belongs to the Wenham Museum over on Route 1A. Uh, she was descended from that family. During the latter half of the 19th century, she, was, she led a very colorful life for the time. Uh, she was a spiritualist, an actress. She was the founder of the first uh, stock exchange for women. She was an advocate of free love. And she was uh, the first woman to run for president uh, in 1872. She advocated for women's rights, and she also um, advocated for reform of divorce laws of the time. However, many suffragists shied away from her because she was so extreme. And that was something I think we see in politics you know, every decade and, and in every generation. You know, there are people who are more or less extreme. She was extreme, and so many people who certainly believed in the suffragist movement still didn't want to go as far as she was going. The next and only other woman to run for president in the 19th century was Belva Lockwood, pictured on the right, uh, who ran in 1884 and again in 1888. After that, it would be decades before another woman's name would uh, appear anywhere on the presidential ballot. In 1874, the Women's Christian Temperance Union formed. And in addition to becoming a powerful voice against the evils of liquor, this organization was also an important force for women's suffrage. Not surprisingly, the liquor industry did not women want women to win the right to vote because they felt that women would immediately vote to ban liquor consumption. <laughs> In 1878, a woman's suffrage amendment was introduced in the United States Congress. It did not pass. But it is interesting to note, if you look at this map here, that many individual states had passed some sort of suffragist legislation far earlier than 1920. The olive states gave women no voting rights at all. Uh, in the light orange states, a uh, woman could vote in a presidential election. In the dark orange states, women could vote in the primaries. And in the blue states, women had full voting rights. This was probably because, if you notice like the blue states, the, it is, it's probable that, that's, that that was because the, Wester, the West was the frontier at that time. Women shouldered a much greater responsibility in establishing that frontier and a much greater role. Uh, and it's possible, too, that it was an enticement to get women, uh, more women interested in coming out West because it would, it, they, they had something uh, to offer. 
However, despite um, this state-by-state -state, uh, uh, offering of various rights, suffragists felt that nothing short of a constitutional amendment would guarantee them their full rights. In 1890, the organization that had split into two was reunited under the leadership of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. However, she, uh, she only remained its leader for a short amount of time uh, because some felt that she was too, too, uh, too controversial. Now you might think that every woman would have been in favor of women getting the vote. But that wasn't true. In 1911, the National Association of Opposed to Women's Suffrage was organized by a group of wealthy and influential women. Uh, and they were also joined by <coughs> many Catholic clergymen and uh, some in uh, wealthy and powerful industrials as well. This organization was further fueled by many distillers and brewers. <laughs> Locally, the February 6th, 1912 edition of the Salem Evening News declared, When women oppose suffrage. Mm -hmm. So, even in our own backyard. <laughs> and here is why. Here's a poster showing what would happen to a woman's home <laughs> should she be granted the right to vote. Posters and pamphlets. This one was done, was actually produced in, in Britain, but there were very many similar ones in the United States as well. And they basically proclaimed the ill that would result if the suffragists were successful. As you can see, the children are left at home. There's holes in the socks. There's nothing to eat. Mm -hmm. it's, like a, it's like Mary Poppins. <laughs> the reasons they gave were many, including no woman who may vote will attend to her domestic duties. It will make dissension between husband and wife. Or conversely, men and women are so much alike that men can represent a woman's view. <laughs> when woman will vote as her husband tells her to. Or probably what really was most, mostly the case, women will form a solid party and outvote men. <laughs> but my favorite, my absolute favorite, Women have no powers of organization. <laughs> Despite this, in 1912, Theodore Roosevelt's Progressive Party became the first political party to adopt a woman's suffrage uh, plank in the bid for presidency. However, so finally, women were beginning to make some real political headway. But Roosevelt was not elected. Woodrow Wilson became the next president, and he was anti-suffragist. During the early teens, the National Women's Party organized hunger strikes and picketing. At first, Wilson uh, was tolerant, but eventually he ordered the protesters jailed and where they received much publicized ill treatment, including forced uh, tube feeding um, and uh, beatings and a lot of ill treatment. It became a publicity nightmare for the White House, and eventually Will, uh, Wilson ordered that all of them be released. The United States entered World War I in 1970. 1917, and almost immediately the Wilson administration called on women to support the war, war effort. All over the country, women massed behind the war. Thousands of women volunteered their services. They joined drives to sell war bonds and liberty bonds and uh, war saving stamps. They sold them in uh, club meetings and on the street and in shops. Others helped the Red Cross to provide medical supplies and services to the military. Yet others worked with government agencies and one of the, or one of the one, numerous women's organizations that cropped up to support the war effort. Thousands of female volunteers had the chance for the first time in American history to wear Red Cross and other uniforms that marked them as people with influence and knowledge and skill. 
and more had the unprecedented opportunity to join in certain areas the um, armed forces. During the fall of 1917, the United States Employment Service recognized that thousands of women would have to work in the war industries. Women came out of their homes to do the jobs that had been classified as jobs only for men, that men were only suited for. It was clear that women would have to take over jobs that men had, had been doing. And here's a picture of women uh, in a welding shop. Now, obviously, in the view of suffragists, the fact that women were being called upon to support the war effort in such important ways just added and reinforced the argument that women should be given the vote. The National American Suffrage Association, under the direction of uh, Carrie Chapman Cap, formed a plan to coordinate a nationwide suffrage uh, uh, lobbying at the state and federal level. They employed the successful men's tactics of meeting <coughs> the politicians and leveraging those in favor to get those people to, um, to convince their peers to also support the movement as well. In 1918, Wilson came around to their point of view, encouraging the House and Senate to pass the amount, am amendment, saying it was an act of right and justice to the women of the country and of the world. However, it failed to pass. Mm -hmm. Finally, though, in 1919, it did pass, but it needed to be ratified by 36 states in order to change the Constitution. 35 states ratified it, and then all eyes turned to Tennessee. As you might remember on the uh, state map that we left at earlier, uh, Tennessee was one of the blue states where there were no rights given to women up until that time. So the vote looked to be extremely tight with no clear winner and the fight was on and it was uh, known as the War of the Roses uh, because delegates in favor of um, suffrage wore yellow roses and those opposed wore red roses mm -hmm. into the chambers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the swing vote was in question, held by Harry Byrne, a young representative. And when I say young, he was about 24 years old. His earlier actions and statements had conflicted and left everybody sort of wondering what he was going to do, although it seemed likely that he would be swayed and would vote with his constituency against it. And as a matter of fact, he might have done just that had it not been for a letter from his mother. From his mother. <laughs> <laughs> Feb Byrne was an independent-minded widow caring for a farm in Tennessee, but she found time to keep up on the progress of the suffrage movement. She said that recent news about the uncertainty of the outcome finally compelled her to write to her son, vo voicing her sentiments. And here's the letter. A piece of it. Hurrah and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. I noticed Chandler's speech. It was very bitter. I've been waiting to see how you stood but have not seen anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat with her rats. Is she the one that put rat in ratification? Ha! No more from Mama this time. With lots of love, Mama. And so Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify the amendment. Women had finally won the right to vote. So what happened then? Well, Let's switch gears completely and talk about fashion mm -hmm. and its role as an, as an indicator of the transformation. <clears throat> Between 1900 and the mid-20s, the feminine ideal in America underwent a remarkable and virtually complete metamorphosis. At the turn of the century, the Gibson girl, pictured here, defined the age. The phrase was made popular by illustrator uh, Charles Dana Gibson. Um, and the Gibson girl was defined by hair upswept, displaying uh, her forehead, and long, a long skirt with uh, no view of the legs, and um, a narrow waist, a maternal and wifely manner. 
the Gibson girl always appeared aloof and incapable of any improper thought or deed. <laughs> she was cultured and intelligent, but would not mix in politics and the like. By the 1920s, the Gibson girl had vanished. <laughs> and in her place was the flapper. It seems that the term flapper referred to fledgling bird, not quite ready to be out of the nest, and possibly sort of awkward and gangling a bit, too. I read another version of that, that the girls like to wear the men's boots open without laces in them, and they flapped when they walked. And I, I've heard that, too, and that may have been, you know, nobody, it probably came, sure. came from a lot of different places. Sure. Um, so that is, yeah, I have read that one as well. They wore galosh kind of things. Right. Yeah. That flopped. Quite unlike the Gibson girl, the flapper cut off her hair, concealed her forehead, de-emphasized her curves, and showed as much of her leg as possible. She also wore plenty of makeup, which up until that point in time would, had only been used by loose women. <laughs> During the first half, of the first half of the 20s, skirt length became the boiling point for social revolution. Since 1915, skirts had been drifting up. Uh, and after World War I, uh, hems were up six to seven inches above uh, the ground. By 1920, it seemed that all restraint had been thrown to the wind, and they went up another five to six inches. The shorter skirt was not the only major development in women's fashion. Everything was being lightened and simplified. No more petticoats, chemises, and corsets and such. In 1928, the Journal of um, Commerce declared that the amount of fabric required to make up a woman's costume went from 19 yards in 1913 to a mere 7 yards in 1928. Almost just a third. The 1920s also witnessed an explosion of beauty shops, which went from 5,000 in 1920 to 40,000 in 1930. Sales of cosmetics jumped 400%. And in 1921, the first Miss America pageant uh, was staged in Atlantic City, where women could now actually publicly display all their charms. <laughs> While women's poli expanding political opportunities contributed to the sense of new woman, changes in work were equally important. Uh, World War I brought short-term opportunities for a variety of jobs for women, so they learned things beyond what they had known before in terms of, of employment. In addition, new business technologies, such as typing and stenography, uh, vastly increased the number of clerical jobs. Women flocked to this new white-collar uh, opportunities because it was uh, more prestigious and paid more. Clerical work became increasingly dominated by women. And, uh, and it expanded from just stenography and typing into bookkeeping and um, clerking and such. More than 88,000 women were employed by, by, as telephone operators. And by 1917, women accounted for 99% of all switchboard operators. I just want to tell a funny story, though, or a funny little anecdote. Topsfield, in, in, uh, where I grew up and my, my mother and many generations back. One of Topsfield's early operators, her name was Belle Dingle. <laughs> at the turn of the century, young working women had most often lived at home or boarded with a family uh, near where they worked. In the 1920s, between school and marriage, they lived in their own apartments and often shared apartments with other working girls. Having their own apartments gave young women a sense of autonomy and adulthood, of being unsupervised and unrestrained. It gave their parents a lot of worry. <laughs> For good reason. <laughs> Jazz was all the rage, and the newspapers in New York and American reported its results on the national character saying, moral disaster is coming to hundreds of young women through the pathological, nerve-irritating, sex-exciting music of jazz orchestras. <laughs> in just two years in Chicago alone, 
the Illinois Vigilance Association reported the downfall of a thousand girls could be di traced directly <laughs> to the pernicious influence of jazz music. <laughs> A social worker reported on the unwholesome excitement she now encountered even at small town dances as boy and girl couples left the hall in a state of dangerous disturbance. <laughs> Bathtub gin combined with jumpy jazz music, suggestive couples dances, and short skirts all led to a new era of relaxed sexual freedom. Rudolph Valentino made millions of women swoon. And branded chic condoms, pictured here, <laughs> held all the promise of romantic Valentino-esque liaisons. <laughs> One father of the time described his experience thus. I was sure my girls had never experimented with a hip pocket flask flirted with other women's husbands, or smoked cigarettes. My wife entertained the same smug delusion and was saying something like that out loud at the dinner table one day. And then she began to talk about a girl my daughter associated with, saying, they tell me that Purvis girl has cigarette parties at her home. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth was regarding her mother with curious eyes. She made no reply, but turning to me right there at the table, she said, Dad, let's see your cigarettes. <laughs> Without the slightest suspicion of what was forthcoming, I threw Elizabeth my cigarettes. She withdrew one from the package, tapped it on the back of her left hand, inserted it between her lips, reached over and took my lighted cigarette from my mouth, lit her own cigarette, and blew airy rings toward the ceiling. <laughs> my wife nearly fell out of her chair and I might have fallen out of mine if I hadn't been momentarily too stunned to do so <laughs> young women working women often modeled their behavior and their dreams <coughs> on movies in the 1920s movie stars replaced political, business, or artistic leaders as role models for young, for young people. Ironically, the movie industry in turn picked up their themes from the lives of young working women who made up a large part of their audience. Films showed office workers and department store clerks working alongside wealthy male bosses and colleagues. And the, the message was that if you, if you displayed spunk and cleverness, you could use your position to get ahead. In 1928, 39% of college graduates were women, which was up from 19% in the turn of the century. That same year, women began to uh, compete in track and field events at the Olympics. Women had not competed at the first Olympics in 1896, the opinion being their competition would be impractical, uninteresting, unesthetic, and incorrect. <laughs> they began competing in 1900 in lawn tennis and golf. Women's swimming was introduced in 1912. However, American women did not compete in that first swimming competition because American women were required as part of competition to wear skirts. It was difficult to swim in a skirt. <laughs> So throughout the Roaring Twenties, women were enjoying new freedoms, work opportunities, and even the robust pro prosperity of the decade, of course. So what did this freedom and frivolity look like? Well, let's take a quick look. Doesn't it? 
Of course, the giddiness of the 1920s couldn't last with the stock market crash and the subsequent depression through the 30s. There was even some ground loss. Some states actually passed laws um, preventing the, the hiring of women with the thought that those jobs were being taken away from men. But at the same time, there were gains in other areas. Uh, Frances Perkins uh, became Secretary of Labor and became, she was the first woman uh, U.S. Cabinet Minister. Jane Addams became the first woman, woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And Eleanor Roosevelt changed the role of First Lady forever, becoming a representative to the UN uh, and taking actions such as calling a press for conference and inviting only woman reporters. <laughs> Then came World War II, and many women signed up to go overseas, while many more women went to work again uh, in the uh, support of the war effort, just as they had done in World War I, once again proving that they were equal and integral part of the fabric of our nation. And so... We come back around to the foreshadowing words of Abigail Adams when she wrote, If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by laws in which we have no voice or representation. How right she was. As we've seen the incredible evolution that could not have been imagined by Abigail, or perhaps even by the women at that first convention in 1848. It was a long road, but with much perseverance by many, individuals and organizations, women won the right to vote, to work in a wide variety of careers, to wear what they wished, and in all aspects to experience a new level of independence that would carry them forth into the 20th century and beyond as a powerful political, economic, and cultural force. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. On International Women's Day, they wear black roses. Do you know the origin of that? I don't. But I, now that I know that, I will look up. <laughs> There's so many things to know. I, <clears throat> yeah. I graduated as an engineer in 1955, and there was one girl in our class. I understand now there are more lady engineers than around mm -hmm. then. Yes, and also now there are more women college graduates. More yes. women are graduating from college, are, are graduating from college now mm -hmm. than men. I think that happened fairly recently. In the last few years, <coughs> it's tipped. Probably more physicians as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a statistic on, I think, PBS News last week, but at any rate, uh, and what they are saying right now, there are 54% of medical students in the United States are women, mm -hmm. which I thought was surprising. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew it was high, but it's over. Yeah. I think engineering is still, mm -hmm. there are more. Yeah. Engineering tends to still be mm -hmm. one of the, the um, majors that's struggling. There's not as many women. They're going into a lot of different areas. For some reason, they don't seem to go as much into engineering. But that, I, that will probably continue to change. Yeah. In the first school for women in Troy, New York, um, they were offering chemistry and other science-related courses. Did they find women who could teach those courses? Yes, there were. Well, I mean, you know, uh, Emma Willard and, and others, you know, who, could, who studied on their own. You know, and who studied textbook. I'm sure there are many women who did their own self-study. It's just that there was no education, formal education offered. To them. <clears throat> and they brought in men. There, men, I think, you know, at least some of the more forward-thinking ones would teach as well. Mm -hmm. But um, Eleanor Roosevelt was very, very important. Mm -hmm. Yes. And a lot of things. Yes. Yep, she crisscrossed the country, uh, you know, supporting her husband's agendas, and you know, just she was she really changed the role of first lady um, in a way that had never really been done before. You know, it, women, you know, I'm sure 
I'm sure you ladies all know, women have been, you know, what, now and in the past, have been running things for a long time. It's just that they never ran them in the foreground. <laughs> they were always running them in the background. I heard a lot about Eleanor Roosevelt, but she, she, you know, they always did say, oh, she's so ugly, and you know, all this, you know, and then it was so sad in a way. <coughs> she was so smart and so dedicated. Right. But well, especially at that time, you know, women were, you know, looks, even then, you know, looks yeah. were more important. They become, they become less important over time, but. How about the air company? They had, they need a lot to get free. They still wear in the, mm -hmm. they really held back. Yep. And, you know, who knows when that, if or when that will mm. be. Unbelievable how far behind there. Well, thank you.